And if you have a Bible, which I hope you do, turn to Psalm 40. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the, underneath the seat in front of you. You can grab one of those and turn to Psalm 40, almost in the, towards the middle of your Bible. We have been journeying our way through the Psalms over the summer. And I have to admit, each and every week, I feel like this is my favorite psalm. And so um, this week, Psalm 40 was my favorite psalm. And uh, I said David uh, has just a way of putting things. Um, he is certainly a man after God's own heart because he is such a worshiper. He's such a praise uh, worthy kind of guy that gives God all the glory and honor, and uh, you can really relate to the things that David uh, David says and things that he experiences, and he's very transparent in a lot of his uh, praises to the Lord and also calling out unto the Lord. This morning we come to a psalm that's a psalm of victory, a psalm of confidence. We talked about one of those before, but Psalm 40 um, talks about David being delivered from a pit, and it begs the question, have you ever been in a pit? I mean, throughout the years... Uh, There has been on TV through live uh, news stories of children who have fallen into an abandoned well or cistern or tank, and uh, they follow the story, and some of them end in the most horrific way you can imagine, but every once in a while, there's a miraculous recovery. And uh, when I was a child, I remember of a story of baby Jessica, and baby Jessica was a 18-month-old child from Midland, Texas, who was visiting her aunt's house, and uh, she fell into a well that was about eight inches around and she fell 22 feet down below uh, the surface. And uh, for 56 hours, firemen and police had developed a plan and tried to drill down a parallel shaft next to her and then uh, tried to go across to her, but they were, didn't realize the well was surrounded by rock, and so their jackhammers couldn't make it through the rock. And so uh, they discovered that, and they called for a, a mining engineer to come, and they brought new technology of this water jet-cutting a machine and ultimately cut through the rocks in 45 hours after she had fallen into the well and then uh, before they finally got the tunnel complete and they were ready to make the rescue uh, the the paramedic inched his way down that little tunnel freed her from her position lifted her up and sure enough gave her to another paramedic it gave her another paramedic it got her to the hospital in safety and then the breaking news was she was alive and she was stable and I can remember all the people that had gathered around the place was cheering and clapping and was so excited and those who were watching on the news story shouted for joy and it was such a such a great uh, victory such a great deliverance from this horrible situation. And uh, I'm sure many of us probably could not relate physically to this experience. Uh, For me personally, I'd never fit down an 8-inch well casing, so uh, I could probably never relate to it. Uh, But this story of a pit here, physical pit, um, we probably can't really relate to it physically, but David is going to speak of a different kind of pit. David in Psalm 40 speaks of a metaphorical pit. He, He speaks of a pit that you get into in life. David is describing a time or a situation that came into his life that left him feeling hopeless, that put him into a place to where he was trapped without the ability to get out. Now, I'm confident that most of us could probably relate to that. In our life, through our relationships or through something that's happened in our life, we, we've realized we're in a pit we can't get out. There is something that we can't do of our own. We, are not, we don't have the ability, the strength to do, to rescue ourselves. And we can relate to David because we felt that before. Some of it, like I said, may be in a relationship. Maybe it's a pit in your marriage or you realize we're at the end of our rope. Uh, we have no hope. And if God doesn't intervene, uh, there's nothing else we can do. We've tried everything we can and, and we're in this pit that we need help. And I promise you, if you are married, you may not have ever had a pit like that, but one will come. They always come to marriages. It happens to everybody. Maybe it's a pit in your health. You got a a call or a doctor said you have cancer, and you've entered into this process of understanding that if God doesn't come through and heal you, you know you don't have a chance. Or maybe you was rushed to an emergency room because you had a pain in your chest, and it's changed the whole course of your life and your health. You realize that what you've taken so much granted for, of taken granted for now, is a major problem. And you realize that if something doesn't happen, something does, someone doesn't intervene. You are in a pit you will not be able to get out of. Sometimes it's in our depression or maybe our mental health. Our mind gets flooded with anxiety. Our mind gets flooded with worry, and we can't sleep at night. And we can't function, and we can't we can't go on anymore. And we literally our mind runs wild, and we say, "God, I can't take it anymore. My mind won't shut off. I need some help. I'm in a mental health pit. I'm I'm to where I need some intervention." Or maybe it's just your walk with God. You've been a Christian for a while, and you've walked down a road to where you've become very discouraged. 
You have no joy. You have no fire. You don't have that peace of God in your life anymore. And you realize, God, I can't keep going like this. If something doesn't happen, if something doesn't intervene, then I'm done. I need something in my life to change my situation. Well, David doesn't really in particular tell us what the pit was in his life. But we know it was dark. We know it was hopeless. We know it was a place where it was impossible for him to get out on his own. He felt like he was trapped. He felt like he knew he would never make it out. And I know we use this phrase a lot in life, but literally, he was at rock bottom. There was, no, there was nowhere else for him to go. He was as far as low, I mean, as low as he could go. And the question is, what do you do when you hit rock bottom? What can we do when we hit rock bottom, when we, when we have no hope of making it out? Well, David has a wonderful testimony. Psalm 40 is a testimony, a blueprint that David gives us in his pit. And out of this pit, he will come and we can see the victory that he has. And hopefully this morning, as we read this and as we talk about this, it will encourage our hearts and we will know that we can be uh, delivered just like David. So I want to read all of Psalm 40. Uh, we're only going to be able to talk about the first three verses, but I want to read the whole psalm for you. It's going to get a little lengthy, but I hope you bear with me because I wanted you to hear the whole psalm at least. So Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, not such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears have, have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness or, and, your lo and your truth from the great assembly. Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up. They are, they are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let me be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. Let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. Let them be confounded because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such your love, uh, let, su let, uh, let such as love your salvation uh, say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. I mean, what a, what a song. You know, I mean, what a story. And uh, as we get to this here, we see once again, we're blown away, away by David's testimony. We're blown away by his honesty of thought. We're blown away by him pulling back the veil of his heart a little bit to see what he's experiencing, what he's thinking, what, he's, what his belief is towards God. And we're carried from rock bottom to standing on a rock. I mean, what a testimony, right? And, and now in due time, we won't be able to cover all these scriptures, but, but I want to cover the first three. I want to talk about uh, and break down to verse three of what to do when you're a pit. First, you see David's problem. Uh, at verse, at verse one immediately tells us, uh, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined his ear. But apparently he says he's fallen into a pit. He's down in this pit. He also says there are uh, numerable evils that uh, surrounded me. So many of them that they're even more than the hairs of my head. Now, for some of us, that's more than others, right? But anyways, hopefully David probably had a full head of hair. He had a lot of enemies, he's saying. I, I am downtrodden. He was so down, he couldn't even look up. And this is a picture of someone being oppressed, somebody being pushed down. He can't even lift his eyes up. 
Have you ever been to a point to where you don't even feel like you can pick your head up? Where you can't even look up, where you can't even stand up? He says, anything that I do, I'm just pushed down in this pit. And the more that I try to get out, the more that I slip. I'm in a pit of like miry clay. The, it's like quicksand. The more you become, the more you move, the more you try to release yourself, the more you become ensnared, the more you realize you're never, ever going to get out. It's kind of like, uh, I like to watch these TV shows on TV like Mountain Men and some of these other Arctic circles that they live up in Alaska. And one of the most important things in the show is that wherever they go, whatever they do in that day, they don't want to get too far away. So if something happens, that they can make it back home. Because by nightfall, if they don't make it home, bad things happen, right? I mean, like they may freeze to death, a bear might eat them, or Sasquatch might rip them apart. You know what I mean? And uh, you guys do believe in Sasquatch, right? You know he's real. But anyways, it, 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 something happens. So what they do is they, they don't want to make too far away from home because they know they can get in serious trouble. Uh, when I left Florida to go to college in, to Alabama, in Alabama, I had, a, I had a Ford truck, and it was a two-wheel drive, and, uh, and, and I took that truck anywhere hunting and fishing here in Florida and had a good time in it, but I didn't realize in Alabama that they had clay, and clay in Alabama is okay unless it gets wet, right? And once it gets wet, like the locals say, it's slicker than a snot on the doorknob, and I don't know what that means, but that's the, it means it's very, very slick. And uh, I used to like to fish in the Tom, Big, Tom Bigby River, and uh, around the way path that you would go, uh, there was like a 10 or 15 foot embankment to get down to the platform to where I liked to fish. And so I'd always drive my truck down there and then I would fish and then I would drive my truck back out of there and make it out of there. Uh, but one day I went when I was recently uh, new to Alabama and had rained the night before and I didn't realize how slick the clay was. And so as I went down that 10 or 15 foot embankment, I started to realize that when I hit my brakes, my truck wasn't going to stop. And I turned my wheels and my truck wasn't going to turn. And so there I was headed straight for the big drop off down to the river. And so through a lot of shouting and praying and probably a few words I shouldn't have said, finally my truck really came to a stop and I realized I was not in control. There was no way I could ever make, it, uh, make, it make that truck stop. I was completely out of control. That clay was so slick, no matter what I did, it wouldn't turn, it wouldn't go forward, it wouldn't go backwards. And, and, and yet so I had to figure out a way how to get back up the hill to get back home. And so back then, I didn't have a cell phone. You guys who have cell phones now are very blessed. I had a beeper, though. You guys remember the beepers, you know? I'm not really sure what good a beeper was because all they could do is tell you they need you to call you, but you didn't have a phone. So I had to walk back up to the little country store there, and I got on the pay phone, and uh, I called my buddy. had a four-wheel drive and had a winch on it. And he came down there, and he shook his head, and he said, See, that's why you shouldn't have been driving a Ford. But anyways, he pulled me out, and he winched me out, and I got up the hill, and I said, Never again. As I was sliding towards that, that platform, as I was sliding towards that, that, that drop-off, I was in full panic mode. I knew there was nothing in my power that was going to stop that vehicle or turn that vehicle. There was nothing I could do. That's the way David was. And that's the way it gets sometimes in life. You feel like you have no control. You feel like there is nothing you can do. And David describes a time in his life, and maybe a time in your life right now, you're there as well. That you realize you're sliding, you're per pushing, and you're trying to turn, and you're trying to work on your marriage, and you're trying to help your children, but you realize this is more than I can handle. I can't do it. I'm, I have no control. And maybe you're here this morning, you think your life was just going to be all sunshine and rainbows, but I tell you, it's not going to be that way. You're going to encounter pits. You're going to have miry clay. You're going to have times in your life where you throw your hands up and say, God, I'm not in control. I cannot save myself. I cannot rescue myself. There's times when you're going to be completely helpless. There are going to be times as a parent when you throw your hands up and say, this is my child and I want to parent the best that I can, but I'm completely helpless here. There's going to be times in your marriage when you feel completely helpless. You throw out your hands and say, God, I can't do it anymore. This is not going to work. There's going to be times in your health when you throw your hands up and say, I'm, I'm completely helpless. And you might say, well, I'm a Christian. I won't ever have a pit like that. Oh, I beg to differ. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're going to have pits. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect marriage or great kids or all the health you could ever have. Listen, we have pits. Christians have pits. And in the Bible, you can't show me anywhere where it says being a Christian says you won't ever have pits. You're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to have pits. But when you go to have those pits and you experience those pits, the question is, what are you going to do when you hit rock bottom? How are you going to get out? What are you going to do? Well, David shares with us the victory he had, and I hope it's a blueprint for you and me. First, David calls on the name of the Lord. 
That's the first thing you see. He realizes he's out of control. He's in a pit. He, has no, he is completely helpless. But verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me and heard my cry. First, David says, and foremost, he waited patiently for the Lord. David knew who to turn to. When, when David hit rock bottom, he looked up to God and called on the name of the Lord. Now, I know this sounds simple. Sometimes it sounds elementary. But many times, this is the hardest step for us. You know why it's the hardest step for us? Because we think we can fix ourselves, right? I mean, we think we have enough answers to be able to, 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 to get our hands dirty, to, to help God out a little or to mix it up. We think that we're charming enough to fix our marriages, right? We think we're smart enough to, to, to fix our kids. We think we're strong enough just to, oh, I'll put my boot, pull my bootstraps up and I'll walk on. Well, let me tell you, there's going to come a time when you're put on your back when you can't do that. And David says, here I am. I know I'm out of control. I know I have no hope, but I am going to wait on the Lord, calling on God, surrendering to Him. It's saying, Lord, I'm in a pit and I'm now I'm surrendering completely to You, Lord. I'm calling on You. And I know that I'm here in this pit because you have allowed in my life or you've caused it in my life. And I know you're the only one to help me. And it begs the question, where do you go when you hit rock bottom? You know, where do you go when you, want to, when you need help? I mean, do you go and seek out pleasure? In our world today, people say, well, pleasure, just go have a good time. But guess what happens when you have a good time? The next morning you wake up, guess what? You're still in the pit. You're still in the miry clay. Or maybe someone might say, oh, just go get another relationship. If you don't like that spouse, go find another spouse. If you don't like that girlfriend, go find another boyfriend, whatever. However you want to work it, you say, just go find another relationship. That's all. It's the other person's fault. Or maybe you just go buy more stuff. What you need is a new car. You need a pool in your house. You need a boat. You need, you need jet skis. You need all these things. Just go find more stuff and you'll be fine. But what you realize when you get to those things, they're just like miry clay. The more you try to fill your heart, the more you don't call on God, the further and further you sink into the pit and you realize it may be temporary relief, but yet you realize that you are not getting any help, that you're getting worse. And David says, that's where you don't go to the things of the world. You go to God. You surrender to Him first. God, here, let me call a time out. I'm calling to You, Lord. I'm surrendering to You even in the midst of this pit. I'm surrendering to You. And David calls on the Lord, but I love this part. It says that God hears his prayers. It says in the second part of verse 1, it says, He inclined his ear to me, or he inclined to me and heard my cry. When David called out on God, God heard him. He turned his ear towards him. David got God's attention. David heard God, uh, I mean, God heard David's cry. What a picture. You know, when we call on God, it's not on deaf ears. That we hear it, we have a God who cares, we have a God who loves. And even at the deepest, darkest moments of our, our life, we call on God and He hears us. He hears when His children call on His name. You know, as a parent, there are certain things you recognize that you'll never forget. Things that you experience, like dirty diapers. You know, you'll never, never get over knowing what a dirty diaper is like, right? You'll never, you'll never forget some of the good things, but you also never forget the cries of your child. You know, if you, when we first had our first child, Tucker, uh, every time he whimpered or cried, we'd run in there. What's wrong with him? Is he hungry? Is he food? Does he need to go to the doctor? You know, we were so cautious of him, but we realized that that kind of cry was just a basic whine that they may be hungry or maybe they were just, they were just fussing a little bit so they get some attention. And, and yet when you have your third child, you're like, let him cry it out. Who cares? They're just fussing, right? So what? They're hungry. We'll feed them in an hour. We'll do this. We'll put that. We'll change them later or change them later. And so, yet your first one, you're so attentive, but then there's another cry where they're playing with their brothers and sisters, they're getting a fuss, right? And you're in the other room, and you hear them fussing and fighting, and someone will take one's toy, and the other one will get that toy, and they get a little spat. Next thing you know, they're screaming and crying. You go, oh, they're just fussing with one another, right? Like they're arguing with their brother or their sister. But then there's the cry that every parent knows. It's, the, it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. When that child cries, you know it's hurt. You know there's something seriously wrong with that child, and that cry sends chills down your spine. It's a cry and a shrill you'll never forget. It's a cry that when you hear that, you drop everything you have, and you incline your ear to hear where they are because you know it's in trouble. See, that's what David is saying here. God is in heaven, and He hears our cry. When we cry to Him and we are in trouble, He hears our cries. He inclines His ear to us. God cares for you and for me. Let me tell you, if you're in a pit this morning, above all else, if I could just let you understand that God cares for you. He sees you. 
He hears you. He knows his own. He knows when you cry to him. He inclines his ear. What a beautiful picture of God the Father inclining his ear to his child. And David says, I cried to the Lord and he heard me and he cares for me. God does care about you and he cares that you're where you're at. But then not only that, but David's rescue. Look at verse 2 right here. This is where it really gets good. He says, he also... So he heard me and climbed his ear, but he also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. I mean, not only does God hear our cry, he can do something about it. And let me tell you, if you're a Christian, you have a testimony of this. You know our God delivers. David proclaims that God brought him out of this pit. He brought him out of this miry clay. God reached down and he was able to do something about it. Let me tell you, when I was a child, when I called out for something, I didn't want some weak person to come help me. I wanted my dad to come help me because I knew he was able to do something about it, right? That's what David is saying. I called upon God. He is strong. He is mighty. And he brought me out. He grabbed me by the neck and he pulled me up and he set my feet on a rock and he established my steps. I mean, what a, what a great picture of deliverance. He says he went from sinking sand to his feet on a rock and he established his steps. And it's what a great picture of God's deliverance. Let me tell you, as a Christian, never lose your faith in God. Never lose your faith that God is able. You know, we don't serve a weak, milquetoast God who can't deliver. No, we serve a God that can do anything. We serve a God that can take your mess or your pit and pull you up out of it and put your feet on solid ground in a moment. He can rescue you. I love to hear the stories of the Bible. I love to read the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament, we hear the old victories of God, and we see it so clear in the Old Testament. Uh, you see Moses as he's standing there and God's delivering the people and he gets down to the Red Sea and he can't go any further and he looks up and he sees Pharaoh and all his army coming towards him. And the people start crying out, oh God, did you bring us out here to die? And here was Moses who led him there going, God, what are you going to do now? We can't swim. We can't fight. We're just stuck right here in the midst of impending danger because we're either going to drown to death or we're going to be killed. Which one, which one is it going to be? And God says, he, when Moses cried out to him, he said, take your staff, stick it in that water. And God parted the Red Sea. I mean, he took and parted the ocean. He made it stand up like an aquarium on both sides. And he walked through on dry grass. I mean, that's the God that we serve. You know, I love the story of, uh, of Daniel in the lion's den. You know, Daniel in the lion's den, you hear the story of how Daniel serves God and he won't back down from God. You know, we get so much pressure from the world and we think, well, if we don't bend to the world, if we don't bow to the world, how are we going to make it? How is our children going to make it through school? How is our children going to make it through life? How am I going to make it in my job or my career? Daniel says, no, I would rather praise God and, and purpose in my heart not to sin against God than to, and pay the consequences. And that's what he did. He, they took Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den because he was faithful to the Lord instead of the ways of the world. And the king comes in the next day and he opens up the pit and he goes, Daniel, is the God that you serve, was he able to deliver you from the lions? And guess what? Daniel says, he sure did. He gave him lockjaw, <laughs> right? He, they didn't touch me. And I used their tail to swap the fly his way all night long. Like he didn't touch me. Like God delivered and he shut the mouths of lions. And here was David even telling this story. David going before a giant. A giant that no one can slay. And sometimes in life you have something that comes against you and you realize there's no way I can do this. And here is David tried everything in the world. They tried to put armor on him. They tried to put a sword in his hand. They tried to do all that. And David says, I am who I am. And God is who he is. And let me go see this giant. And I know God will give me the victory. And he stands there with a sling and some stones and he let it go, hits the giant in the head and he falls to his death. He cuts his head off and he slayed the giant in David's life. I mean, this is the God that we serve. And he's the same God we serve today. He's the God who can heal all our diseases. Listen, it's great to go to doctors. It's great to have medicine. But oh, let me tell you, God can touch you and heal you. And we serve a God who can restore marriages. Listen, your marriage, you may think, is not even ever to be reconciled. I can give you testimony after testimony of Christian couples where God did something in their marriage that completely changed their marriage and restored their marriages. God does it with drug, drug addiction. God does it with drinking alcohol. God does it with all these things. We serve a mighty God. We serve a God that when you're at your worst, He's at His best. And you might say, well, I'm in a pit. Well, I got good news for you. God is the pit master. He is. There's not one pit you could ever get in that God can't deliver you from. Not one. He delivers you from every pit and every miry clay that you're in. He can deliver. And I can stand before you today and I give you testimony after testimony of my life. 
in my life to where I was at the end of my rope and I said I couldn't do it anymore and I called out on God and He did something for me that no one else could do. And listen, we got to have that faith and trust in God that he, he is a God who delivers us from the pits. And this morning, you might say, there's no hope for me, but i got news for you. David says, God can put your feet on a rock. He can put you on your way again. And you may walk in here this morning as a pit, but you're going to leave here knowing that God will and can deliver you. There's no pit bigger than our God. None. So many times we go to God and say, look at my pit, when we ought to go to our pit and say, look at my God. This is nothing for Him. God can do it in a moment. I have prayed and I have worried and I have thought my, uh, worried myself to death of how I'm going to get out of some financial trouble or how am I going to get out of some relational trouble how am I going to get out of this trouble with my children. And yet I've went to the Lord in one moment. He did more than I could ever do in a lifetime. He delivered me. He's taken care of my problems and that's the God that we serve. And David says that's where we are when we're in a pit and there seems to be no way. God always makes a way. He always makes a way. And listen, for you and for me, we can trust it can he do it? Yes, he can. He can do it. In your life, he can do it. You say, well, I'm just a young person. I'm in high school. You won't believe the things that's attacking me in high school. He can deliver you from that pit. He can keep you from that pit. Or you're saying, well, I just got married, and I know it's not right, and our marriage is wrong, and all we do is fuss and fight. Welcome to the club, all right? Welcome to the club. That's all I got to say. God can deliver you. He can make you peaceful. He can bring 50 years of good marriage in your life if you trust in him. He can pull you out of that pit. Maybe you have a child. You say, you know what? We're trusting in the Lord, but yet he's struggling. He has some sort of trouble or she has some sort of trouble. Give it to God. He can, he can work in their life. He can deliver. He's a God who can. May we never lose faith in a God who can. He is a God who's able. David comes and he proclaims, God snatched me up, put me on solid ground, and put me on my way again. I mean, what a picture. You know, when we, was, uh, when we first bought a boat, I can remember when my kids were younger, and uh, we was out there in that boat, and they say two greatest days of your life when you buy a boat, right, and when you sell it. That's the two greatest days, all right? A boat is just break out another $1,000 every time the season comes around to get it running again. But I can remember, you know, Courtney was at the age, she was probably four or five years old, and uh, she thought she was big, and she thought she was tough, and she thought she could handle everything, and the boys were up there fishing, and they, we had a, a trolling motor on the boat there, and they were doing different things. She said, I got it. I don't have to sit down. I can stand up. So she got over right on the edge of the boat by the back of the boat. And sure enough, uh, one of the boys or one of us hit the, hit the uh, trolling motor and went one way and she went the other way. And she had her life jacket on. Man, she went into icy cold water. She went down. And before she got all the way down to the ground, I had grabbed her by the back of her uh, little life jacket. And I pulled her right back up with one hand and set her back on top of the boat. And you would have seen the shock and despair that came over her face. She pouted the whole rest of the day, by the way. But, but I mean, what a picture. What a picture of us like that sometimes, that we think we got it. We think we're so good. We think we got it covered in our marriage and our health and our life. And all of a sudden, something wipes us off of our feet. But what a picture of God that can reach down and pull us right back out of that water and put us right back on his seat of safety. That's what David is saying God did for him. And if he could do it for David, he can do it for you. And he can do it when you call on his name. He hears your prayers and he can do something about it. And not only does David get delivered, David has a praise on his mouth. Look at this, verse 3. He says, he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. I mean, David now proclaims he's put a new song in my mouth. You know, David came out with a song of pity and he leaves with a song of praise. He came out in with a song of pain and he comes uh, in a song of despair. But now David says, I got a new song. I went from pity to praise. You know, when I was a kid, I loved pity parties, right? Aaron would probably say, I still love pity parties. You know what a pity party is, right? It's when you get all down on yourself and depressed. And you want to talk about how bad things are and how bad life is. And you just have a good old pity party, right? But when I was a kid, I'd have a pity party. My dad would come home on Friday nights and he'd say, all right, put your party shirts on because we're going to have pizza. There's going to be no crying, no whining, no, no, no complaining when we go have pizza. We're all going to have pizza. And what's better than for a fat kid to have pizza on Friday night? I mean, there's nothing better than that, right? I mean, my pity was turned to praise. Me and my brother was going to the pizza place, and we were playing arcade games. We are having a good time. We had a party time. That's what David was saying. In my heart, I, I went to God. He delivered me. It's party time. It's time to proclaim His name. It's time to sing the song of victory. You might say, oh, well, I got joy, joy, joy down deep in my heart. Well, let your face know, all right? Put a smile on your face. Put a song on your lips. That's what David is saying. It's a song of victory. I'm praising the Lord. He delivered me. And I want other people to know it. I want other people to see it. What a worshiper that David is. 
Listen, when we come to church, that's what we do. We call it corporate worship. You know why we call it corporate worship? We come to sing publicly the praises of God in our life. Listen, if you don't have anything this week you can praise God for, praise Him for salvation. Listen, praise Him that you were lost and you had no hope without God, but through Jesus Christ He saved you and He washed all your sins away. That alone we should be able to say, thank you Jesus, right? That alone we should be able to put a smile on our face and praise God. That's what we should do when we come together. We give these praises and we worship the Lord and we go from pity to praise. And David's heart was overflowing and now his mouth was a singing. Praise be to God, a new song. And when he gets delivered, he immediately uh, praises the Lord. Why is it that we like to rob God from our glory sometimes, from his glory? You know, sometimes we think, oh yeah, people say, oh, you know, you've been married for 40 years or 50 years. How'd you do it? Well, I was just such a romantic man, you know what I mean? Like I swept her off her feet all over time. Or maybe you did this and you think you had something to do with her. No, why don't you give God his true praise? Why don't you say it was through Jesus Christ, it's through God who helped me through my marriage with your kids. Sometimes people say, oh, that's a great child. How did you raise that child? Not because of what we've done or how we trained them, but because of the Lord. The Lord is who's done this. It's the praise that we should have on our lift. On our lips, when he's lifted us out of a pit of despair, we should have a new song and we should worship the Lord. And God is worthy of being praised, is he not? You know, God is good, amen? I mean, when we come and we have this praise of God on our lips for salvation, for deliverance, David says, when we praise God like that, we have this new song, many shall see it and fear and will trust the Lord. That's what it's all about. You know, God takes you and puts you through tests so you can have testimonies. You know, one of the things when we get together as God's people, we are to share God's work in our life. And as we share that work and share that with other people, it encourages them. It lifts them up. It brings people closer to God to see the goodness of God and the power of God in our life. It gives him glory, not us. I think about it just as a church. I think about having our first ever VBS class. I mean, having our first ever children's ministry, having our first ever uh, couples ministry to come, how God has been so incredibly faithful Not because I'm a good pastor, not because I'm a good person, not because we have good leaders. No, because of the goodness of God, because of how good he is, how he calls people together for a purpose to share Christ, to be able to give God glory. And we ought to have that song in our hearts and our our song in our lips. And when we do that, we bring praise to the Lord. And is it not amazing that God takes the worst of our lives and makes them into the best of our lives? You know, many times we go through that pit and it's the thing that we can't stand. But in our life, we realize it's through that pit that God did its best work. He always does his best work in the pits. You know, there's things that God can do in the dark that he can never do in the light. You know, sometimes it's just when God gets us to the point and when we finally realize that we, he's the only one that we have, he's got us right where he needs us. Because that's when we trust in him the most. That's when we can do, then when God can do his greatest work in our hearts. And, and the question is, what are you going to do with your pits? What are you going to do with your pits? Don't waste your pits. You know, as you come to church, you've got a story to tell about your marriage. When you come to, around believers and, and a lost world, we've got a story to tell about our salvation. When we come around people, we've got a story to tell about what he's done with our kids. We've got a story to tell about how he's worked in our lives and how he's provided for us. We have a story, and as we tell that story, it doesn't bring us glory. It brings God glory. And as we do that, David is saying, this is what our pits say about it. It proclaims God's goodness and deliverance. Yes, you have pits. Yes, we have pits. Yes, I've had pits. We've all had pits. But the question is, what are you going to do with your pit? If you do what David has done and you call out on God and he delivers you, you can praise God and you can bring glory to God from his deliverance in your pits. And listen, you might ask yourself, even today, you might be in a pit. You might walk in here this morning and you say, you know what? I can't do it one more day. I can't make it one more day. I mean, my mind is, is shredded in a million pieces or my heart is totally discouraged or my marriage is completely broken or my kids are completely gone. Let me tell you, don't ever give up on God because he hasn't given up on you. This morning, I know you, it's hard to believe this, but it's so true that if God can love us even when we were a sinner, that he sent his son to die for us, he surely can hear us when we're in our pits. He cares for you. He knows your cry. He knows my cry. And if we're willing to surrender to him, he will incline his ear to us and he will lift us up out of that pit. He will put our feet on solid ground and he will put us on our way again and he will put a new song in our mouth and many will see it and praise God for it. Amen. That's what he says. Man, I love what he, how he closes this here in verse 17. We won't be able to get to it, but verse 40, 
Here's what David says, but I am poor and needy. See, David just this confession every saying, I'm poor and I'm needy. Yet the Lord thinks upon me. See that? That, that's a way of expressing that God's thoughts or His care is for him. He says, I may be in this pit, but I know, I know the Lord has not forgotten about me. He thinks about me. And then David proclaims, you are my help. You are my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. What a prayer. What a prayer. And this morning as I close, I just want to read those first three verses again. I hope it speaks to your heart as it has spoken to my heart, and as we get time for preparation of invitation and commitment, I pray that we will have this in our hearts and our lives. So let's, let me read it one more time. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and He set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear it and will trust in the Lord. Amen and amen. Let's pray together this morning.